Live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents. David Wall. Kegro in the morning show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Friday, December 22nd, 2017. Uh, the day is already getting longer, as you can feel it happening. Did you get outside for the solstice? I did. You know, nothing happens, as it turns out. I guess unless you live near a Stonehenge, you won't notice any difference. I don't know what I was expecting. I, I know what the solstice is. I just sort of said, all right, well, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'll go outside and uh, say, okay, look at this. At this moment... The sun, we are tilted, I guess, as uh, far away from the sun as possible. And now, uh, well, not as possible. I suppose we could just roll over and fall off our axis. Anything is possible. Trump might even declare it to be true at some point, And uh, then who knows what we'll do. But uh, I, I, I just basically was out there for the moment where we turned over from 1128, was it, to 1129. And be able to say, ah, I feel like we've moved, uh, we've tilted closer towards the sun Already, I can feel the warmth. It was a nice warm day. Very pleasant. How are things down on the Tropic of Capricorn, everybody? I bet you're sad because your days are getting shorter. Ha! In your face. That's what I say. That's the way I approach global issues like this. And why not? I think that's the new policy. As it turns out, something I had paid uh, almost zero attention to, because I'm usually paying almost zero attention to Nikki Haley doing anything, uh, almost uh, twice... Uh, or, or more so when she's uh, working at the UN, of course. I, I don't keep a close eye on what goes on at the UN, but apparently uh, we're angry at everyone in the world, which is a terrific way for us to show global leadership. We, uh, I guess we, there was just a a UN, what is it, was it a Security Council resolution or was it a General Assembly resolution? It must have been a General Assembly because the votes, uh, a lot of votes were cast. And I guess condemning the decision of the United States to move or to uh, to officially locate its embassy in Jerusalem rather than the uh, what has now become the traditional spot of Tel Aviv and uh, all the issues that are wrapped up in that, of course. Uh, well, uh, the world knows what they are and President Trump really doesn't. And so we now find ourselves on the uh, the wrong end again of a resolution condemning United States action. And I guess Nikki Haley, to ingratiate herself to the boss, uh, addressed the General Assembly thus, and uh, and she's proud of it because she's tweeting it out. America will put our embassy in Jerusalem. No vote in the United Nations will make any difference on that, but this vote will make a difference. You ready for the, the Trumpian part of this? This vote will make a difference on how Americans look at the UN. Probably not true. And on how we look at countries who disrespect us in the U.N. This is now a disc game. And uh, the United States is ready to, I don't know what, punch everybody in the face. Uh, except uh, all we have is a, uh, a a weak and crumbling old man at the helm. So I'm not certain who's going to be doing any of the punching. Uh, not to mention that uh, I guess if they say something nice about Trump himself and wave some cash around, uh, Jared Kushner will get interested too, and uh, all of a sudden they'll be back on our good side again, and they'll be the the good countries that we like because they pay money to the Trump family. Well, uh, sad notion, but probably true. Uh, lots going on this morning, lots to catch up on, um, and uh, we'll probably be using uh, today's live show and anything I can force myself to sit down and prepare for the vacation break. I'd like to be able to. I, what I'd really like to do is, of course, catch up on all the stories that I've been holding. And, and these uh, pre-recorded show days offer us an opportunity to do just that. Let's catch up on things I've opened, things that are the chronologically at the top of pocket for today because I just put them there. That's the order in which I keep my stories. Whatever's on top, I'll tell you what's happening. That means it's it's hot or just grab my attention. And that means it's therapeutic for me to tell you what's going on. But before I do... Of course, because uh, because it's there, I'll remind you, Bill starts us off each morning all the way from Portland, Maine, with a morning tweet to let everybody know that the show is live now. And it's true. Daily Coast Radio is live now. OMG, it's the k X Christmas special with special guest, the Osmond Brothers. Man, it's been a long time, Osmond Brothers. So long, in fact, 
that I uh, only know Donnie. Uh, what's the what's the name of the rest of the Osmond brothers? Man, I, look, Donnie and Marie. That's it, right? I know there's other ones. I've heard them referred to repeatedly as the Osmond brothers, and I don't know any of the rest of them. So trivia for those of you who uh, feel like it, and you can, uh, w- I don't know, without looking at Google, how many Osmond, how many are there? Could be a hundred, for all I know. And uh, what are the names? Tito is one of them. I know that, right? Am I wrong about that? I got the wrong family. All right. Uh, Albert Titus, by the way, says, uh, Kagerox used the term Stonehenge instead of the correct Stonehenge's monster. <laughs> Always. Uh, I like, I like the crossover in that. Very nice. <clears throat> Lots of you uh, tweeting, lots of good comments and interesting stories today. And uh, we will, uh, well, let's hit on some of those. As a matter of fact, Darwin Darko, our good friend, has uh, sent this one along. Perhaps you saw this one. Uh, as, as he says, B- better bigots, better oligarchs. Papa John's, the Papa John's uh, CEO, the founder and CEO, uh, is out. He's, he's uh, gotten the boot. From the company, he's not out. I guess he's just down. He's out as CEO. Weeks after his NFL comments, as it turns out, and I have a, I think I have one or two other stories about it. But the one that uh, Darwin sent us here is uh, a sports uh, section entry. I think at the Miami Herald. Although I don't know, it says sports, but uh, uh, it doesn't really say what section it's in here. Nah, and it's written by, uh, well, it's an AP story, the retail writer. How do you like that? No, we should have gotten you the story wholesale, but we'll pay retail prices for this one. Papa John's founder exiting as CEO weeks after NFL comments. You remember all of that, of course, and he was coming out, I guess, trying to be in support of Trump. Maybe he's, he had his eyes on the big government pizza contracts that they so often. <laughs> I have no idea why he was thinking that. I, that comes to mind because I don't even know what the situation was, but I did see early this morning uh, fly by on, on Twitter a photo of the CEO of AT&T. Greg probably knows what's going on because I think he tweeted it uh, or was commenting on it. The CEO of AT&T uh, really like supplicating himself before Donald Trump. Um, they are, uh, I guess... Uh, serving as accomplices in this ridiculous claim that bonuses that they are handing out are uh, somehow windfalls or trickles down, I guess we could call them, uh, from the tax cut, which of course hasn't been implemented yet, so that would sort of be impossible, but you could give out bonuses in, in anticipation of a big tax cut. But apparently, A, they were previously scheduled, B, they're going to be rather heavily taxed, and C, uh, AT&T is also poised for a big round of layoffs. <laughs> so, I mean, if it's really the case that this big tax cut is going to create jobs, well, uh, so far we uh, haven't seen it and aren't likely to see it. And all CEOs that I know of who have commented honestly on what they were going to do with these tax windfalls have said, yeah, that's not the kind of money we would give away in wages. It would be entirely unnecessary. We're at record profits. We're not going to be hiring anybody. All the the teaching we learned in MBA school, the part of it that actually works, tells us, you know, if you're generating record profits and uh, otherwise doing pretty well, the idea of sending more money out the door and incurring more liabilities and bigger costs by bringing on more employees for no particular reason is perhaps the least desirable way of spending any of this money. Anyway, Papa John's founder is where we started on our tour of corporate America is, is out. Uh, Papa John's founder, John Schnatter. That's his name. I'd go with Papa John too. Schnatter's pizza doesn't sound particularly good. Well, well, and it isn't. So uh, that would be accurate. So much for truth in advertising. He'll step down as CEO next month, about two months after he criticized the NFL leadership over national anthem protests, by uh, which they aren't, but they occur during the national anthem. And now everybody thinks that they're protesting the national anthem, and they're not. Protests by players, comments for which the company later apologized. Schnatter will be replaced as chief executive by Chef Boyardee. No, uh, chef, chief operating officer. I looked like chef for a minute 
Steve Ritchie, who cannot decide on what his first name is, on January 1st, a great, it's a big pizza day, and a good day to uh, kick off and turn over a new leaf and, and probably put it on the pizza and say it's a topping. Uh, the company has announced on Thursday, Schnatter, who appears in the Chan's commercials. Ooh, what will they do about that? Will Steve Ritchie take over, or will he continue in the commercials and just say, I'm not the CEO, but buy the goddamn pizza. He appears in the Chan's commercials and on its pizza boxes, remains chairman of the board. He's also the company's biggest shareholder. That, so he's it's like seven slices worth of the company is in his hand. Earlier this year, Schnatter blamed slowing sales growth at Papa John's, an NFL sponsor and advertiser, on the outcry surrounding football players kneeling during the national anthem. Former San Francisco 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick had kneeled during the anthem to protest what he said was police mistreatment of black men, and he was right when he said it, and also other people are kneeling. And other players started kneeling as well. The controversy is polarizing the customer, that one customer, and polarizing the country, Schnatter said during a conference call about the company's earnings on November 1st. That was a pretty dumb context in which to pick that up, and that's why he's getting kicked out, I guess. Papa John's apologized two weeks later after white supremacist praised Schnatter's comments. The Louisiana, I'm sorry, the Louis, Louis, Louisville, Kentucky-based company. I had no idea they were based in Kentucky, that famous, delicious center of pizza production. Louisville, Kentucky-based company distanced itself from the group, saying that it did not want, oh, uh, did not want to them to buy their pizza. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Richie declined to say Thursday if the NFL comments played a role in Schnatter stepping down, saying only that it's the right time to make this change. They had to do it in 30 minutes or less, so congratulations on getting that done. Shares of Papa John's are down about 13% since the day before the NFL comments were made reducing the value of Schnatter's stake in the company by nearly $84 million. Schnatter owns about 9.5 million shares of Papa John's International Incorporated, and his total stake was valued at more than $560 million on Thursday, according to FactSet. The company's stock is down 30% since the beginning of the year. I think it's possible that this was a conscious decision to get him out of the line of fire, said restaurant analyst John Gordon, who's the founder and CEO of Pacific Management Consulting Group. The focus of the brand needs to be the pizza. So I guess that means he's done with the commercials, because that would be pretty counterproductive if they just kept putting him in the commercials, I think. Schnatter, 56, founded Papa John's more than three decades ago when he turned a broom closet at his father's bar into a pizza spot. That's why it tastes like brooms. Since then, it has grown to more than 5,000 locations. Schnatter has also become the face of the company, showing up in TV ads with former football player Peyton Manning. Schnatter stepped away from the CEO role before. He has? Okay. In 2005, but returned three years later. Mmm, delicious and uh, nutritious. Uh, what else? Uh, new ads are coming out next year. The company uh, said Thursday that it had no plans to remove John from our communications though they may just spring it on us later, which it says includes pizza boxes or commercials. They already paid for the boxes. The leadership change comes as pizza makers, which once dominated the fast food delivery business, face tougher competition from hamburger and fried chicken chains that are expanding their delivery businesses. They, they do? Look at this. McDonald's Corporation, for example, expects to increase delivery from 5,000 of its nearly 14,000 U.S. locations by the end of the year. Wow. Okay, well, I had no idea that they were going to do that. Uh, hmm. Would I ever order McDonald's? I hope not. Richie said his focus as CEO will be making it easier for customers to order a Papa John's pizza from anywhere. It's been a huge problem. I'm on a very tall hill. Will you give me pizza? Yes. All right. That's a strategy that has worked for Domino's. <laughs> what a dumb story that says. Why am I reading this? I thought sometimes I read these stories just to be to make myself aware of how dumb or pointless so much news content is. All right, I mean that's a hell of a strategy. Why can't I be a CEO? I'm a, at this point, I should just be CEO. What's your strategy? I think it should be easier to order our pizza. Really? Are you sure? Well, wait a minute. I mean, from anywhere. Oh, well, you know, that's totally different. 
That's a strategy that has worked for Domino's, I would tell them. And they would say, you're right, I read it in the paper. I understand they take orders from tweets. That's kind of dumb. But uh, text messages and voice uh, voice activated devices such as Amazon's Echo, which is just another... That's not really surprising. Okay, Papa, uh, uh, Amazon's Echo, you tell, what, Alexa, to message uh, the Domino's people or, or use the Domino's app and, all right. It's all very interesting, but uh, why picking up the telephone and saying, hello, bring me a pizza is so difficult, I have no idea. Papa John's customers can order through Facebook and Apple TV. <laughs> Plus thinking really hard and wishing on a star. But Richie said he wants the chain to be everywhere customers are. Everywhere. So now by using urinals in uh, your local, uh, whatever, in the Port Authority, you can order pizzas that way. It's amazing. And appetizing. And descriptive of the pizza you're going to get. The world is evolving and changing, he said. Yes, and they are buying less pizza. Richie, 43, began working at Papa John's Restaurants. Restaurant. It says restaurant, but I, I don't think anybody calls it that. Uh, 21 years ago. What a life. Uh, making pizzas and answering phones, the company said. He became a franchise owner in 2006 and owns nine locations. That does not seem like sufficiently uh, uh, significant a, uh, a resume, but I'm sure there's more to it. He was named chief operating officer three years ago. Richie said plans for him to succeed Schnatter were made after that. Uh, okay, and that's it. Like that's that's the, what a, what a great exit from the news. All right, so a guy who started by answering phones and taking pizza orders 21 years ago, uh, and rose to prominence, rose to the level where he himself owned a Papa John's pizza franchise, and then eight more of them. Uh, there you go, CEO. And I guess it's a, it's not got big. He's not got competent shoes to fill. They are pretty big, but uh, competency, uh, highly questionable. And I suppose, uh, in that sense, low bar over there at Papa John's. So good luck. You won't need very much of it. I'm sure you'll do fine. Stephen Ritchie, good luck uh, picking a first name there, too. Uh, I hope it works out for you. And if you can't think of a last name, Jones Smith, you know, anything like that could work out just fine. Uh, let's see. That was not really top of the, the news necessarily for me, but it'll be a bit of a hodgepodge today, and maybe we'll just have fun with what's there. This doesn't look like a lot of fun. The Hill has this story. I saw it uh, circulated a couple of days ago in a few other outlets, but I'm reminded that I, I have it here. President Trump's nominee to be the Pentagon's health chief. And remember, the Pentagon runs a gigantic socialized medicine program, uh, the biggest one in the country and one of the more successful ones at that. The Pentagon's health chief, has or the nominee has withdrawn from consideration after a Senate panel stalled his confirmation over comments on gun control. Now, interesting. I mean, and they're not even that, you know, that controversial. Uh, there's a lot of guns used by the Pentagon and they control them pretty tightly, as a matter of fact. And uh, I don't know why this would get in the way of anything, but you know how sensitive gun people are, and in particular, people in, during the Trump administration. Any personal affront and they consider any disagreement with them on any political issue to be a personal affront will be enough to sink your nomination i have more to say on nominations perhaps after this uh hopefully i can remember till the end of the article here i am sorry not to be able to assist defense secretary jim mattis whom i deeply respect it's one problem in building the best and most efficient military health care system possible dean winslow wrote in an op-ed in the washington post announcing his withdrawal I have the credentials to help. He owns uh, 10 Papa John's pizza franchises, including 35 years of experience in the Air Force, including four deployments to Iraq and two to Afghanistan after 9-11 in military and academic medicine and in private practice, public hospitals, the Department of Veterans Affairs, the pharmaceutical and diagnostics industries and public health. But unfortunately, I do not possess one credential the committee wanted to see, I do not support the unrestricted ownership of semi-automatic assault weapons by civilians. Hmm. Winslow, who was nominated to be Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, had his confirmation hearing before the Senate Armed Services Committee last month, days after a mass shooting in Texas in which the shooter was able to buy a gun despite being convicted in the military justice system of domestic violence. 
Winslow was asked about shooting during the hearing, to which he replied, huh, I mean, what an interesting question to ask him. I mean, I guess so, right? Uh, I understand in the military, people get shot uh, with some frequency, even when we're not actually fighting a war. Some of it is by accident. So uh, what do you think about shooting? Well, it's bad. Oh, well, then you can't be Assistant Secretary of Defense, apparently. Uh, so he asked about the shooting. He replied, but I would also, but I also would like to, and I may get in trouble, you're right, with other members of the committee, just say how insane it is that the United States of America, in the United States of America, a civilian can go out and buy a semi-automatic assault rifle like the AR-15, which apparently was the weapon that was used. It's an extraordinarily popular mass shooting weapon, by the way. Committee Chairman John McCain interjected, telling Winslow, I don't think that's your area of responsibility or expertise. It's probably not. Uh, McCain also warned Winslow about a written answer on abortion. Maybe that's it. Winslow wrote that, quote, therapeutic abortion services should be provided by the military in appropriately staffed facilities. Well, that'll get you in trouble. Therapeutic abortions, it says, refer to situations in which the mother's life is in danger. Uh, that make that's, you know, that's probably a little clearer, but that's the terminology they chose for it, probably to make it sound unnecessary. Federal law does not allow military medical facilities or Defense Department dollars to be used to provide abortions, except in certain circumstances, like if you are a uh, pregnant Yemeni or uh, at a wedding in Afghanistan, in which case, by all means, anybody in the neighborhood gets aborted. You may want to clean up this abortion issue, okay? Or you're going to have trouble getting it getting it through the Senate, McCain <laughs> cautioned. Wow. That's a, uh, they're, they're pretty offhand about abortion when they want to be. Two days later, the committee advanced a slate of nominees, but not Winslow. It, at the time, McCain told reporters his fate would depend on how he answered follow-up questions about his testimony on guns and abortion. What are they even asking him about that for? That's the, oh, I guess the abortion thing makes sense. That's the way we do business, McCain said, of not yet moving forward Winslow's nomination. We have people before the committee. If there's additional questions, we honor other members' right to ask additional questions and get answers. In his op-ed, Winslow said he has no regrets about his testimony. Having semi-automatic weapons makes no sense, he said. It's a public health issue that, as a doctor, I feel compelled to bring to the Senate's attention. As a citizen, I am saddened that our government has become so dominated by pro-gun lobbyists that an appointment such as mine, which has no responsibility for gun control, can be sidelined by a single sentence of informed personal opinion, and that really is insane. So he's hit the insane word twice there, and I think he's right in both circumstances. Too bad, although, you know, how sane could you be saying, yes, I'll serve in the Trump administration? Well, I guess if you're sane enough, they find out uh, soon enough to make sure that you don't serve in the Trump administration. So maybe it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy on that. Um, generally speaking, on issues of uh, appointments, I should bring this up. And I didn't pay very close attention to exactly how this came to pass, but I'm familiar, generally speaking, with this situation. Uh, and I... I wonder whether there might not be whether we might not be looking at a situation where Democrats in the Senate didn't really put their stick their necks all the way out on slowing nominations down here. But it may be that these things were piling up for so long and there was the, the Democrats had come up with nothing in particular to argue against the nominations. But uh, here's what happened. A, uh, a roll call article here. Uh, Nils Lesniewski, one of their top reporters, has been around a long time there, as I recall. A Senate Christmas present. Several Trump nominees confirmed. Senators finished delayed routine business. Hard choices put off. As you know, most of the hard legislative work was uh, kicked down the road a little bit until next year. But nominations we're taking care of, and you'll see in the article why that's the case and learn a little bit about procedure and the Constitution along the way. At the very end of an acrimonious first year working with President Donald Trump in the Oval Office, the Senate reverted to form, looking very much like the Senate. 
Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell came to the Senate floor after 9.30 p.m. to call for voice votes on a slew of pending Trump nominees to posts across the federal government. The Kentucky Republican, with the help of Senator John N. Kennedy, Republican of Louisiana, minding the president's, uh, the presiding officer's chair, also moved a bunch of cleared bills through unanimous consent. Nominees confirmed included members of the Securities and Exchange Commission, ambassadors and other State Department posts, and assistant secretaries for positions in an assortment of cabinet departments. It was the kind of routine nominations package that observers of the Senate might expect in any other year, even with someone other than Trump in the Oval Office. The flurry of activity came as senators reached an agreement to call up a short-term government funding bill practically as soon as it arrived from the House Thursday, with passage 66 to 32 after a minimum of debate and just one procedural budget vote. During the vote sequence, which came around dinnertime Thursday, one senator could be heard hoping the votes would move forward quickly enough to make an 8.06 p.m. flight to Charlotte because that's really what they care about, of course, and uh, no surprise there. By the way, I will probably, uh, well, one, we'll have to delay the end of the article until after our first break, but we'll also take this brief pause to note that 6632, of course, means that there were some Democrats who voted for the funding bill to keep the government open, and that by itself sounds like a you know reasonable thing to do, except, of course, Democrats over the last couple of days, had been, as a group, uh, well, maybe not, I don't know how, how unified they were in all this, but it seemed like it, and that, that's a good thing, holding out against the uh, agreement to, uh, to, to run a funding bill, a, a continuing resolution, unless the Dreamers situation, the DACA Act, was addressed, uh, or some in some cases, chip was addressed before the end of the year or before the spending bill went forward and uh well faced with the prospect of a shutdown they simply said we'll turn that off hi it's me david waldman your host for kago in the morning interrupting this little break to say thanks so much to all of you who are contributing supporters of kago in the morning Thousands of you are downloading the show each day, but fewer than 1 in 25 regular listeners are donating to help keep us on the air. For the money you'd spend on a single three-minute iTunes song, we bring you two hours of great news and entertainment every day, five days a week. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com makes it easy. You can find us there by searching Kegro X or David Waldman or Kegro in the Morning or even Daily Coast Radio in their search box and you'll be right where you need to be to make easy, recurring, monthly contributions to support our show. Once again, thanks so much for your support. Welcome back to the Kegro in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. When we uh, last left off, and rather abruptly at that, I was uh, discussing this roll call article about the flurry of last-minute activity in the Senate, including a number of nominations that sailed through and some unanimous consent bills, and uh, noting that, yeah, Democrats had been holding out or saying they were going to hold out on uh, uh, on avoiding a bill to avoid a government shutdown unless... The DACA issue was addressed, and then it wasn't, and they said, well, uh, hmm. it's probably better for us, and it probably is, not to force a government shutdown at this point. But I'm sure it was a great disappointment to people who were holding out for the DACA reauthorization, and uh, it's not likely to happen any time real, real soon, but we'll see whether perhaps returning after the break makes any difference or whether any deal was cut. Uh, I don't know whether you could trust any such deal with Republicans, but it's possible that uh, there, you know, if there are some, if there's any interest on the Republican side in dealing with the issue that they may have said, look, let us get out of here now. Let's make sure the government doesn't shut down. That's not really going to help anything. If it shuts down, it's only going to make the situation worse. It's going to give ammunition to Trump to blame you for various things. Uh, I could see them being talked out of it, but uh, that doesn't, it's not going to lessen anybody's anger about this stuff. And if they weren't serious about it, they shouldn't have uh, tried to, uh, to tie the two issues together. 
But minds can change and deals can be struck or you can realize the futility of what you're doing rather quickly up there, especially if you're trying to get out of town for the holidays. Well, let's see. The uh, the article continues. There was bu- Senate Budget Chairman Michael Enzi of Wyoming passing out Christmas cards on the floor during all this flurry of activity. But it wasn't, and while it wasn't, I should say, a signy die adjournment. We talked about that yesterday, or I mentioned it. And in case you didn't uh, pick up on the terminology, uh, of course, you know, congressional elections on the House side every two years, Senate terms, of course, lasting six years. But uh, uh, And so one-third of the Senate faces election every two years along with the entirety of the House. When the entire House turns over uh, and, and is reelected, even if it's all the incumbents reelected again, that's considered to be a new Congress. Congress adjourns uh, sometimes temporarily, a lot of times during the year, takes vacations for a week or two. They don't call them vacations. They call them district work periods. And they are busy times. They're not exactly vacations. Uh, but uh, at the end, so each Congress lasts two years. At the end of the first year, they move from the first session to the second session. I am not really certain why they even bother with separating it into sessions. I'm not sure where that idea even came from. I wonder if I could look that up and read about that at some point. But uh, it doesn't make any difference for legislative issues. We mentioned that yesterday. In other words, a bill written during the first session of the... What Congress are we even in now? Are we in like the 115th Congress? I've lost track. If you're not there every day, you you, you forget uh, which Congress you're in. But otherwise, it's just one of the daily... Uh, it's a sort of a daily thing. It's in front of your face all the time, so you never forget. But uh, yeah, I think we are. Right, 115th Congress, so I'm not that far off track. Uh, so we're at the end of the first session. It was from last January to now. And in fact, they'll probably hold themselves in the first session uh, through the break and into the new year. And then at the same time, they'll they'll adjourn the first session and convene the second session pretty much at the same time. I don't even know if there's really any formal uh, anything that goes on. I can't recall, uh, which I guess suggests that they don't do anything particularly special about it, not like adjourning a Congress sine die, which is, uh, I'll explain in a minute, the end of the Congress, um, or opening a new session. They don't vote on rules or anything. Everything just continues basically from one session to the next, except one thing. Um, but, uh, as I mentioned uh, at the end of the second session, that's when the Congress closes, they adjourn. That's the terminology for it. Sine die S I N E D I E. And, uh, uh, that is, that closes the, the Congress out and any unpassed bills, any bills that have been submitted for consideration, whether they've had hearings or not, whether there's had any, uh, amendments added to it or not, if they haven't passed, they're dead. And if you want to consider them again, even in situations where a Congress gavels out, adjourns sine die minutes before convening anew as the next Congress, you can't carry the bill over with you. You can take the text with you, of course. There's no prohibition against that, but you have to resubmit it. And technically, at least, that means a brand new bill gets a new number and it moves through the same process, it's got to go, you know, through hearings and through the committee process again. Though, you know, if it's a special project that has the blessing of leadership, it can move through that very quickly or various parts of the process can be waived, perhaps. But the the point is that technically everything needs to be reintroduced. Uh, not the case in between sessions, but it becomes important to note there are some things that the uh, adjournment of a session actually has an effect on and guess what that's nominations those are not legislative business they're handled by the legislature that is by at least one branch of it one house the senate handles it but that's considered executive business and the senate maintains a totally separate calendar and everything and even uh, conducts business in what they call executive session when they are considering executive business and not legislative business so that's different And apparently, I don't really know why they decided this was the case, but it's constitutional, I believe. When a uh, nomination is not 
been uh, disposed of one way or another, either considered and rejected or considered and affirmed. The nominations still pending at the end of the session in which they are made are returned to the White House. Uh, and that, again, comes from the olden days, wherein uh, the nominations were um, manifested, let's say, by the president by committing them to paper. You'd write them down and transmit it as a written communication to the Congress, and they'd carry the paper in there, and they'd announce its presence when it arrived at the Senate, and the Senate would put it in the, you know, on a certain desk and and note in its journal that it had received those communications, and then consider the nominations uh, or whatever else the president was communicating to them in due course. Um, but these pieces of paper and the nominations that go with them or that are manifested in them, uh, made manifest in them, are returned physically to the White House and. Uh, the president can renominate those people, but just like you know the bills that have to get resubmitted in a new Congress, they have to be submitted all over again, and again, technically, they start the process all over again, and so that means uh, hearings and and uh, the like if if you ever had any, start all over again, uh, and again, they can waive those too, but uh, technically you 're back to square one so in other words, there was a big raft of lingering nominations, which, had they not been considered and moved through the Senate last night, would have essentially expired, would have been returned to the president, and he would have had to nominate them all over again. And he might have done that, which means it might quite possibly just have been a useless gesture. Uh, and uh, had they been renominated and hearings already been held on them and everyone was ready to move on them, it's very likely that the chairs of the committees of jurisdiction who oversee the departments to which these people were being nominated might simply waive the necessity for further hearings and say, uh, read what we did last time if you forgot how the hearings went. So it might not gain you a great deal. But, of course, it also means that they're back on the docket and Mitch McConnell has to try to find floor time for them and Democrats can continue to do what they can to make it a giant pain in the ass to confirm them. Uh, but I think I'm, I'm wondering whether uh, the usefulness of the tactic may have worn out. It hasn't, of course, prevented the worst tax legislation ever proposed from getting considered and passed. It didn't prevent the worst health care uh, proposal ever brought to the floor from getting consideration, though that one failed. But it has, of course, occupied a tremendous amount of floor time and kept the Senate from doing much else, though they may not have had much else planned. Anyway, just to wrap up with this article here, uh, it wasn't a sine die adjournment, but the Thursday session did have a sense of finality with two senators casting their final votes and bidding farewell to their colleagues for entirely different reasons. Appointed Senator Luther Strange of Alabama's time as a senator is coming to a close with the arrival in January of Democrat Doug Jones, who, of course, prevailed in a special election, and Senator Al Franken. A Minnesota Democrat has announced his resignation, which will take effect on January 2nd, prompted by allegations of sexual harassment. But some advocates came away with lumps of coal. Supporters of providing a legal pathway for undocumented people who came to the United States as children generally voted against the continuing resolution, which left those senators hoping for progress in January. I did not support this government funding measure because it did not include the DREAM Act, said Senate Minority Whip Richard J. Durbin, it's Dick Durbin, for those of you who read the news frequently enough. Uh, by the way, they helpfully tell us an Illinois Democrat, in case you didn't know. This isn't just about the DREAM Act for these young people. We're fighting for the American dream, he said. Businesses supportive of the Export-Import Bank, many of whom might have cheered the lower corporate tax rate coming with the tax code overhaul, so-called tax code overhaul, were given reason to be frustrated Thursday night. Oh, no, frustration on top of a giant tax windfall. Who can, you know, anyway, Senator Pat Toomey would not allow the Senate to confirm nominees. He stood up. 
would not allow Senate to confirm nominees to be members of the Board of Export-Import Bank and aid to the Pennsylvania Republicans said Thursday. Under Senate rules, nominations, there we are, it's not constitutional per se, but Senate rules. Hmm. I, I mixed that up. Nominations to the chamber must be acted on during the session in which the nomination was made or else they are returned to the White House. This restriction is often waived by unanimous consent, anyway, at the end of a session. In the case of the bank, Toomey wants to see former New Jersey Republican Representative Scott Garrett confirmed as leader of the agency, but Garrett faced bipartisan opposition at the Senate Banking Committee, which voted down his nomination earlier this week. And I do have a piece about that, if I can remember to get to it. It's relatively rare, let's say. Uh, Forget it. We won't need the piece. We can just say it. The last, uh, apparently, according to the Senate historian, I saw this, uh, I saw it on Twitter, so you know it's true. The last nominee that was rejected in committee, in committee, was Jeff Sessions in his nomination to the federal bench back in the 80s. Of course, he famously rebounded from that and became uh, one of our most virulent racist bastard senators who then went on to become the current attorney general. So uh, maybe big things in the offing for Scott Garrett. I will support these nominees either in block or I will support them sequentially, provided that Scott Garrett is confirmed first, Toomey said last month. And as long as that is the case and Scott Garrett is confirmed by the United States Senate, then I will support, as I say, reconstituting the quorum on the board. The, uh, uh, what was it? The Export Import Bank Board, I guess. If not, then I will do everything I can to prevent XM from getting a quorum. So I guess they can't do anything uh, while they have not got a quorum. Toomey followed through on that on Thursday. Even with the holiday spirit seeping into the chamber, there were calls for lawmakers to stay in town, including from Democratic senators like Bob Casey of Pennsylvania, who blasted the passage of a short term reauthorization of the Children's Health Insurance Program as part of the continuing resolution, as opposed to a longer-term deal, that is. The Republicans who run Congress had all the time in the world to cut taxes for the super-rich and big corporations and now are urgently skipping town before families who rely on CHIP have peace of mind in knowing that their kids' health care coverage will continue beyond a matter of weeks. Instead of passing this bill, which stiffs kids, our law enforcement officers, and fails to protect the dreamers, Members of Congress should stay in town and address these issues, Casey said in a statement. Of course, Western senators said, easy for you to say, Mr. Pennsylvania, and wanted to take their leave. Senator Ron Portman, uh, Ron, it's Rob, isn't it? Portman, it says Ron, they're mixing them up here. A Republican from neighboring Ohio, who was one of the key architects of the tax overhaul, took to the floor after most of his colleagues had headed for the airport to praise the reports of companies granting bonuses to and increasing wages for employees in the aftermath of the tax plan being sent to Trump's desk. But Portman took much the same view as Casey when it came to CHIP, saying that he thought the short-term punt was unnecessary when the Senate Finance Committee had already approved a broader reauthorization unanimously. I don't get this notion that we couldn't pass it because we couldn't find the pay-fors. The pay-fors were there. Portman said, and of course you shouldn't be needing them at all in the face of giving away giant uh, tax windfalls with no pay-fors in the tax bill, but whatever. They want they, they insist that there be pay-fors. That's nonsense. But the pay-fors are already there, and so no point in delaying, but they delayed anyway. Still, that and other pending business will have to wait. Other than a brief pro forma session, or a few of them, without any legislative business, the Senate's cha- Senate chamber's doors will be closed until the beginning of January. So that's where we stand in the Senate. A little bit of a question mark as to why Democrats might agree to allow a raft of uh, lower-level nominees through when they could have simply said, no, uh, we will not agree to unanimous consent for continuing their nominations in the second session, nor will we allow for an en bloc vote on Uh, dozens of nominees at once. We're going to do these things one by one, and we're going to, uh, uh, I guess, what's left, attempt what's left of the filibuster so that you have to spend 30 hours uh, ticking down the time to invoke cloture by majority vote. And uh, for every 30 hours you're willing to spend here from this point on the calendar on, you can get one of these nominees through. 
But I guess at some point there's some diminishing returns on this in terms of uh, functioning of government. Not that this government is functioning all that well, but uh, we've read a number of stories about uh, uh, government functions, which uh, if you're operating, well, if you're operating under legal strictures, things that need to get done can't get done because there aren't any permanent uh, uh, office holders in place. All we have is a slew of acting office holders, and they're just ignoring the law as it is anyway. Uh, although, you know, you could stop things and highlight that issue and say, you know, we haven't given our consent here for these people to do this job, and yet they're doing it, and they're doing it with impunity. What what good is having a law that says you can only serve for 210 days if the Senate has no intention whatsoever of protecting its prerogatives in this area? But uh, I will say they do have full plates over there in the Senate in terms of things that they could and should be outraged about and fight daily about. Um, and and perhaps for whatever reason, well, you know, I mean, I'd like to hear them state it. I'm just supposing that this is the case and uh, putting it out there as a possible excuse. Don't know whether they really believe this or not and don't know whether we should either. But it may be the case that they've reached the conclusion, that at least some of these lower level jobs, it's just better to fill them and move on to other fights and continue to delay people, perhaps the top positions. But uh, I don't know. I kind of like the continuing storyline that uh, nobody was in place to do any of these jobs and the federal government was a total wreck as a result of Trump's incompetence in appointing people. Uh, although, you know, I guess at some point, if you uh, don't step out of the way of those who have been nominated, that storyline loses its luster if he can point back and say it's Democrats blocking them. It's not that I haven't made nominations. Anyway, we will uh, definitely keep an eye on how those things develop in the next session. Other interesting stories of note up at the top of pocket and uh, our other storage facilities for such stories. Let's see. Um, oh, uh, yes, of course, we would have to note that, yeah, uh, as we noted in passing, the continuing resolution was adopted. NPR reported a uh, piece out for us that I grabbed just by way of documenting the fact that they did this. The House passed it first, sent it over to the Senate, and they very quickly moved that through. Uh, Trump was... Uh, 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 pushing for it last night via Twitter, uh, insisting in, in his tweets that House Democrats want a, all caps, shutdown for the holidays in order to distract from the very popular, just passed, tax cuts, which he capitalized. House Republicans, don't let this happen. Pass the CR today and keep our government open. And uh, so they did. And so he will uh, no doubt consider that to be a gigantic victory. And no, no one was really hoping for a shutdown but uh, that doesn't stop him from saying such things. All right, let's see. Back to uh, Pocket, and uh, man, where where are we going to go for this next one? Hmm, uh, an awful lot to uh, consider here. Uh, here's an interesting piece uh, I, I put aside yesterday from also from AP. Just thought this made an interesting bit of reading. Unlike others at Fox... Cavuto, Neil Cavuto, uninterested in Trump interview. I thought he made an interesting point in all this, a relatively brief article. Uh, Fox News is President Donald Trump's favorite venue for interviews, but one of its most prominent anchors, Neil Cavuto, says to count him out as a presidential interrogator, that is, <laughs> as an interviewer. He doesn't think it's worth the time. We're always going to report on the president, <clears throat> said Cavuto, Fox's senior vice president, by the way, and managing editor of Business News. You can't not report on the president, but my goal is not to curry favor so I can get an interview with the president. There's no indication that Trump is anxious to sit down with him, yet Cavuto's stance sets him apart at Fox. It is kind of an interesting stance, isn't it? That's the venue for 20 Trump interviews since he's been president, by far the most of any news organization. Within Fox, Trump has spoken primarily to opinion anchors like Sean Hannity, Laura Ingram, Jesse Waters, and Janine Pirro. Uh, what a rogues gallery that is. Fox Sunday host Chris Wallace and Washington anchor Brett Baer haven't interviewed Trump as president and have campaigned for the time. 
It's interesting that he does only opinion uh, uh, anchors. In August, I mean, it stands to reason. He's an idiot and he doesn't want to face actual news anchors. In August, Bear used his show to tell Trump that he had, quote, nothing to fear from his questions. He renews his interviews requests weekly to no avail, Fox said. Cavuto, who anchors one hour each weekday on Fox News Channel and two on the Fox Business Network, revealed in an on-air commentary that he won't ask for an interview. He said he spoke publicly after some viewers and administration officials remarked that things he had done weren't helping his chances of speaking to the president. That is pretty interesting. For a guy who's not interested in doing it, or who says so anyway, uh, I, I suppose that would motivate me to speak too. The Trump campaign had not appreciated a Cavuto interview with Mitt Romney attacking Trump. Cavuto has criticized Trump's use of Twitter and suggested he needs to show loyalty in order to receive, I guess, loyalty, uh, in order to receive it, it being loyalty. That's that's really, uh, I mean, that's so out of keeping with the way a presidential press operation ought to be running. But I know we know that his is completely abnormal as it is, but it's amazing how uh, overt they are about Demanding loyalty from a supposedly independent press. And I suppose you could ignore the independent press part when you're talking about Fox News Channel. But still, uh, you're, uh, the whole point of Fox News was that it was able to masquerade as traditional news. And it, it doesn't help them do that when you uh, when, when you, you make things so clear and obvious that if you just knuckle under, we'll give you an interview. How interesting is that? It, if he's not requesting them to go out of their way, it's very Trumpian, right? Uh, I, you know, to, to, to take to Twitter and insist that uh, I, they were begging me to do this and I said no when there's no invitation whatsoever and no interest in having the president do something. He likes to try to preempt that by insisting that he turned them down. I broke up with you first. Anyway, pretty amazing. Uh, where are we here? Uh, about Cavuto. He said he's been called an Obama toady. <laughs> yeah, that's what he was. For saying that former President Barack Obama improved the economy. I'm a numbers nerd, Cavuto said in an interview. He came into a meltdown and a mess, and the numbers, when he got out, were a lot better. You can credit him, or you can say he got lucky, but it did happen under his watch. Did it? Yeah, it did there are numbers we use as business journalists to judge the success or failure of a presidency. Presidential interviews are often unproductive because they have a limited amount of time. And, of course, presidents themselves are skilled at filibustering when there are subjects they want to avoid, Cavuto said. Trump adds other complications. His filibusters are just rambling nonsense, of course. A study in the New York Times on Sunday said Trump has made... 103, quote, demonstrably and substantially false statements, unquote, during his first 10 months in office, compared, by the way, with 18 by Obama during his eight-year presidency, okay? We definitely mentioned that the other day. 18 in eight years versus 103 in the first 10 months. Any interview would require me to get clarifications on many of the president's own statements, Cavuto said. I could conceivably be spending half the allotted time just trying to have him explain his saying that, say, this is the largest tax cut in history, when it isn't, or that he inherited the biggest economic mess ever, when he didn't. Just trying to set the record straight, I'd run into a wall and the interview would be over. He's absolutely right. That's a very honest thing to say. Uh, credit to him for that. Jane Hall, a communications professor at American University in Washington, said it's a sad commentary when a journalist of Cavuto's stature, or whatever, takes this stand. Personally, I think it's still worth trying to interview Donald Trump because he so rarely gives an interview. I don't think so. Said Hall, once a commentator on a weekly Fox show on the media, but I can understand Neil Cavuto making that call. Cavuto said he was not criticizing Trump's uh, Trump interviews conducted by his Fox colleagues or anyone else. They always make news, no matter what the exchange with the president, he said. Whether soft or loud, you get news. I just feel there's no added value in me doing it. I feel very much the same way about interviewing almost anybody, to be honest. Cavuto occupies an unusual space at Fox, where, where he's been since its launch more than two decades ago. He's 
not considered a part of the network's stable of virtually all Trump-friendly opinion journalists, yet he isn't afraid to give his opinion. He said he's neither an apologist for the Trump uh, administration nor an opponent. He believes Trump has an economic agenda that could be promising, but that he hurts himself with antics. Cavuto, 59, keeps a cane in his office. How do you like that? Because his multiple sclerosis, did you know that? Sometimes makes walking difficult. I had no idea. Uh, I guess if you're sitting at a desk, there's no reason for me to have an idea. And he's less than two years removed from a heart bypass. Still, he's just signed up for a six-day work week with a two-hour live program on Fox News Channel on Saturday mornings. He said recent visits to presidential libraries for John F. Kennedy and Ronald Reagan reminded him that all presidents, even popular ones, chafe at media coverage. Trump is right to say he gets a disproportionate amount of negative press, Cavuto said, although he's no fan of his attacks on the media. When Trump came out with debating the crowd size at inauguration, that's like me saying it's fake news that I'm overweight, he said. No, it's not. I'm overweight. Any scale on the planet can confirm it. It's human nature for presidents to bristle at criticism. It's a whole other level, I think, of craziness to start saying it's fake because it doesn't go your way. Well, <clears throat> credit to Neil Cavuto for making a certain amount of sense, even though he's working at the uh, Fox News uh, Network, Fox Business Network, wherever he, he nests himself these days. Um, I thought an interesting observation and a good one. Uh, and, and probably one that ought to be applied across the board. There's really just no point in trying to get a to get the truth out of him. I suppose if you're just looking to publish a transcript of him rambling and looking incoherent, it's still worth interviewing him. But yeah, the idea of trying to get him to clarify on issues or give you policy insight, he has no policy. He has no insight into areas where other people have done the job of formulating policy for him. He doesn't know about it. He doesn't understand it. He doesn't care about it. And uh, he's got nothing to add to it. And talking to him is a waste of time. But yes, uh, for the purposes of producing a transcript to make him look like an incoherent, babbling idiot, there's still that. And I still, I guess, encourage people to do that and to publish those transcripts so that we can see it. They always make fascinating reading. All right, we'll catch up on a few more stories and uh, dig a little deeper, I hope, into some others I've been waiting to do in the second hour of the show, coming up after this short break. Welcome back to the Kingo in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We have our short one-minute break at the top of the hour here, sifting through the stories trying to find uh, other ones to stop in on. Some things I wanted to revisit from earlier shows. And uh, let's see. First of all, I guess, we'll make it first of all anyway, uh, The uh, that one college singled out uh, in the last couple of days when we talked about with Joan uh, in the tax bill, and not Hillsdale College. This is the second of the one colleges. <laughs> that would make two colleges. Singled out in the tax bill. Berea College. Uh, and I guess uh, one, uh, I got two notes on the pronunciation. I was saying Berea College, B-E-R-E-A, Berea, you know, no, it's Berea. Like, uh, although somebody gave me a pronunciation guide, a handy pronunciation guide, like diarrhea, they said, it's Berea. But uh, unfair comparison, to be sure, one, an institution of higher learning and the other, uh, well, uh, stomach ailment, and you know all about it. I don't have to tell you much more about it. But I mentioned that Arliss Bunny had had a few things to say on the subject. And uh, did I put the tweets aside or did I just hope that they would linger for a while? I can't recall uh, whether she actually sent me anything about it or not. Let's see. Uh, but she was mentioning in passing, apparently uh, it's regionally famous actually for um, some very uh, accomplished programs in the arts uh, and performing arts and uh, and and uh, crafts as well and and preserving a sort of regional Appalachian culture as well and uh, the more I looked into the profile of it on on Wikipedia even and the more I've been hearing from people about the school the more I wonder what the hell the Republicans in Kentucky are doing approving of this school. I, I thought at first 
after hearing the about the uh, example of Hillsdale College and be, it being a, a uniquely ultra conservative institution that was helping transition people from like homeschooling by ultra conservatives into okay, we'll do a thing that qualifies as a diploma for you so that you can then take a job at the Heritage Foundation and move from one Heritage Foundation job to another, <clears throat> one wing nut welfare job to another. And then be, <clears throat> pardon me, appointed to the Trump administration at some point, and I guess cleared in the Senate at the last minute. <clears throat> I thought the same might be happening here at Berea, Berea College, but apparently not the case. And so uh, I've become uh, a, uh, a believer, let's say, a, and I was impressed by what I had read about it. I'll see if I can scroll back and find some of the other commentary on it from Arliss, but you know, then, of course, uh, in the initial read through, I was struck by that that uh, inclusion of the line about in their logo here. God has made of one blood all peoples of the earth. I mean, it's an inoffensive quote, certainly, uh, <clears throat> and not even one that the Trump administration would likely agree with, nor would most conservatives uh, these days, I think, though they are wrong in that. But uh, I'll tell you what I found even on the uh, Wikipedia page, which I included in the roundup on, on Wednesday. If you took a, a time to look at it, it's actually pretty intriguing. Not only are they uh, a tuition-free institution, which is a, a fantastic model to try to emulate, uh, but as I mentioned, they have this very strong program in in the arts and the like. And uh, is, is this... I got to try and see if I can find uh, Arliss Bunny's uh, commentary about it. I don't know whether she hashtagged it uh, with the KITM or not in my quick scroll. But we got so many messages in the last couple of days. Uh, I can't uh, rely on the usual metric of that feels like scrolling far enough. But yeah, I don't see it up here in the KITM hashtag. What I'll have to do is uh, I can go over to Twitter and call up her timeline and, and see how how much Twitter activity she's had and whether I can find it that way. But uh, she and a few others tweeted me some information about uh, about the place and, and it was really actually rather intriguing and, uh, and uh, laudable. So at the very least, I wanted to sort of correct the record there and say uh, any bad rap that I gave to them on Wednesday off the cuff was, uh, I think, inaccurate and unfair, and uh, they deserve an independent reconsideration of the situation. And, by the way, they do play college basketball there. They are Division Three, but they do play uh, basketball and other uh, sports as well, and it looks like a very nice campus as well, although hardly ever do you uh, send horrible pictures of yourself to Wikipedia. So they're... You know, maybe they're playing some games there, but I don't know. I think things uh, seem to be on the up and up there, and I was pleasantly surprised by that. At any rate, uh, that correction having been made, it's not a super important story in terms of newsworthiness. So we'll move on from there. Got a couple of other very interesting things, too. But speaking of sports, I guess, as we sort of did when we said that they played basketball and other support, other sports in Division Three there. Uh, here's an interesting bit picked up on over at Daily Coast. Maybe you've heard of it. Uh, Walter Eininkel, having written this one up for the front page, Trump made it a, quote, priority to have big sports teams subsidies ban, a big sports team subsidies ban removed from the tax bill. Isn't that sort of interesting? And we look at the, the president's uh, ridiculous and leathery face in the photo illustrating the piece. You remember how Donald Trump has been up in arms about big sports businesses and their tax breaks? When he gets angry at, say, the NFL, that comes up. And here's the tweet, as a matter of fact, from back in October, October 10th. Why is the NFL getting massive tax breaks while at the same time disrespecting our anthem, flag, and country, all of which he capitalized? Change tax law, he says. Yeah. Well, he had an opportunity, of course, to change the tax law and basically to demand whatever he wanted in this tax law because, of course, it came out as though he had written it that way anyway. Any analysis will show you. 
But here's a, here's a funny twist. As the Wall Street Journal explains, Walter tells us, the one clause that may have ended big business stadium subsidies, that's been exercised. Uh, and here the clip from the Wall Street Journal, brief piece that just says, the bill also preserves the ability to use tax-exempt bonds for professional sports stadium bonds, a priority for Mr. Trump, a GOP aide said. How about that? That suddenly became a priority. Trump spent so much time attacking so very specifically, sports businesses concerning those kinds of tax breaks, it is sort of surprising, and he just says surprising in quotes here, that it was a priority for him. Example number, well, geez, what number are you going to? One billion, three million, two hundred thirty-four thousand six hundred fifty-four. It's a facetious number of how full of crap Donald Trump actually is. <clears throat> so, I don't know. Well worth noting, at least, I think, on that front. It's a little bit surprising, but surprising slash not surprising, of course. Uh, I also got this note via the Daily Coast mail system from What Next Now? Our user friend over at uh, Daily Coast, What Next Now? This bit on, uh, well, gun news from Iowa. And uh, here's, the, here's the actual piece sent to me from the Des Moines Register. Uh, you'd think a little bit surprising too. But then again, you think guns, anything can happen. Limits on guns in child care centers are blocked by the governor's staff. Hmm, why would you block such a thing? Well, she's being very reasonable about it. And uh, okay, I could see maybe something, but maybe not about this issue. This one seems open and closed to me. Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds' staff recently blocked proposed state rules that would have regulated the storage of any guns in child care centers, including, and I guess this is where people get nervous, gun nuts get nervous, including those run in private homes. The Department of Human Services rules would have required this very draconian measure would have required that guns kept in child care operations be locked away and kept separate from ammunition. The proposal would also have required that parents be notified if a gun is kept on premises of a child care center. I think that seems fair. Uh, are there guns in this child care center? I don't have to tell you. Hmm. That seems like maybe something I want to shop around a little bit more on this thing. Uh, it also would have barred loaded guns from being carried in vehicles used to transport a child care center's young clients. Also seems like a good idea. Unlike most other states, Iowa has no regulations regarding firearms in child care centers. None at all. How about that? Mark Anderson, chairman of the Department of Human Services Advisory Council, said the proposal seemed like common sense. It just says, you can't have loaded, unsecured weapons when you're watching other people's children, he said in an interview. You can have all the ones you want when you're watching your own children, though. It's just other people's children as a business service, right? People come to expect, for instance, if I drop off my child at the child care center so I can go shopping or go to work for the day, I can expect more or less that my child won't find unloaded, unsecured weapons here and shoot himself in the face. Mm. Maybe. Well, that's good enough for me. Time to go. Time to go to work. Governor Kim Reynolds contends the proposal needs more discussion. She told reporters Tuesday that it might be better to have legislators debate the matter instead of letting administrators use their authority to implement rules on it. Uh, oh, OK, but you know what the outcome of that's going to be. And of course, that's why you're doing it. Reynolds, a Republican who has supported gun rights groups, was asked at her weekly press conference if she believed the state could regulate gun storage in child care settings. I think we're going to discuss that, she replied. I think we want to bring all the stakeholders to the table. Now they want stakeholders. How about that? Right? That's pretty amazing. We should bring all the stakeholders. I forgot that word, but now that I remember it, we should bring all the stakeholders to the table. We haven't done that. We want to make sure that we're looking at it from all perspectives and then decide. So, of course, we'll, by the way, will there be toddlers at the table? to testify that they don't want to uh, accidentally shoot themselves or accidentally be shot by others. And it would be helpful if, for instance, uh, have all the guns you want, just lock them up. That seems like a pretty reasonable perspective for a toddler to have. But 
We want all the stakeholders. So we got to hear from all sides. And you know, we're not going to hear from all sides. It's really unfair. They're going to hold the hearings. There's not going to be a single person there that's, that's going to be there to testify. It's great when kids shoot themselves in the face or shoot others or accidentally shoot childcare workers to death when they find unsecured weapons. This is a fantastic thing. And I'm tired of this PC nonsense saying it isn't. Why they shut those people out of the gathering of the stakeholders, I have no idea, but they so rarely show up even when you open the door to them. An Iowa child welfare advocacy group said Tuesday that it supported the Department of Human Services proposed rules on the storage of guns in child care centers. Of course, children need to be safe. Safety isn't a debatable issue, said Sheila Hansen, policy director for the Child and Family Policy Center. At a bare minimum, a parent should be notified if there is a gun at the location their child is being cared for and if a gun is in any vehicle that a child is transported in. A national survey done in 2013 by the Early Learning Policy Group found that Iowa was one of 12 states that had no regulations on guns in child care centers. Some states bar the presence of guns in such businesses, the survey showed. Iowa Department of Human Services staff members explained their reasoning and documents accompanying the proposed rules last week. While having weapons in any child care setting is highly discouraged, the department is proposing allowance of weapons and firearms only under specific conditions to ensure the safety of children in care, the staff wrote. The staff noted that similar rules are already in effect for Iowa foster care homes. The child care gun rules were withdrawn during a December 13th meeting of the Iowa Council on Human Services, which must approve all such rules before state administrators can put them into effect. Anderson, who is a Lutheran minister from Waverly, has served on the council about six years. He said he couldn't recall a situation in which a proposed rule was abruptly pulled off the council's agenda without a clear explanation. During the meeting, a department administrator said the proposal was being withdrawn so department staff members could work on the wording. Anderson asked the administrator when the proposal would be brought back to the council for consideration. She told him she was unsure. Department staff members wrote in the proposal that they had posted a standard notice of intended action about the rules on November 8th. No one from the public responded with a formal comment, the staff wrote. Uh, but like the recount in Virginia, the next day somebody said, oh, I should have done that, and so could we therefore reopen things and do it again even though the rules say no? Uh, sure, no problem. A leading gun rights advocate said he had been unaware of the department's proposed rules. That's on you, isn't it? Before the comment period closed. Richard Rogers, who is a lobbyist for the Iowa Firearms Coalition, said he expressed concern on December 11th to the governor's office. Reynolds' staff assured him the proposal was being put on hold, she said. Now, what else was Richard Rogers working on, by the way? If he's a lobbyist for the Iowa Far Firearms Coalition and was unaware of uh, rulemaking regarding firearms and firearms storage, what good is he and why don't you fire him? I don't know. That's a question for the Iowa Firearms Coalition, I guess. Rogers said his group hasn't taken a formal stance on the child care firearms rule, but he considers some of the proposal's language vague. For example, he said it wasn't clear to him if the gun storage rules would apply at all times or just when a child care business's young clients were present in a home. We're for the safety of children, Rogers said, but he said he could imagine instances in which the proposed rules would present an unreasonable barrier. For example, he said, if a man ran an in-home child care business, yeah, right. I think, generally speaking, women are running the in-home child care business. But if a man ran one and his wife, this is great, he's trying to be non-sexist. If a man ran it and his wife was a sheriff's deputy who came home for lunch, she might want to drive a couple of the children's child, a couple of the child care clients to their soccer activities without unloading her gun. Would that be allowed, he said? And the answer is no. You are working in a very different capacity now, and you're going to need to uh, prepare for it. Like, for instance, suppose a, a man runs an in-home child care business, and his wife is a neurosurgeon. What if he wants to do some of the neurosurgery over lunch? Should that be allowed? No, it should not, because he's absolutely not qualified to do so. Well, what if he was a neurosurgeon before, but now runs an in-home daycare center? Should he be able to, uh, let's say, 
bring a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with him or some of the kids into the uh, operating room. And uh, why bother washing your hands? After all, I say, you're only going to get dirty when you go back to work at the child care center. Well, no, we require these things of surgeons, you see. Oh, okay. Well, hmm. Well, uh, we're talking about guns and they are magical objects. P.S. Constitution. And so therefore... If people want to drive around with uh, loaded weapons unsecured in their vans, even though they don't work for the child care facility, and take the kids around at lunch, go for it. Because guns. That's essentially what they're saying. I can imagine. I can imagine that this sort of thing would happen. That's a terrible imagination as well. You should be fired just for your lack of imagination. The proposal was also scheduled to be considered last week by the legislature's Administrative Rules Review Committee, but the Department of Human Services withdrew it from their agenda as well. Senator Mark Chalgren, an Ottumwa Republican who serves on the committee, said in an interview that he raised concerns about the proposal before the meeting and he appreciated the department's decision to withdraw it. Policies of such magnitude, magnitude, should be decided by elected legislators, not administrators, he said. Well, it's true in the sense that we will throw your ass out of office if you're against this rule. But whatever. Shelgren said some parts of the proposal are worth pursuing. Others, uh, oh, including requirements that guns be secured when they're in child care operations and that parents be notified if a gun is going to be present in a daycare facility. I think that's actually if you're a gun nut, that should be an advertising point for you. Yeah, we you know, those are those people obviously believe that the kids are safer because of the presence of the gun, because when ISIS comes for the daycare centers, uh, these daycare workers will be, uh, well, shot to death with a gun in their hand as opposed to being shot to death without a gun in their hand. And it's much better, according to the Constitution, if you die with a gun in your hand. Therefore, something, something. But just be careful with it, right? Why can't you just say that? Anyway, he said he disagrees with requiring an ammunition be stored separately from a gun because that would make it difficult for a child care operator to use the gun to protect children in an emergency. Of course, it also makes it difficult for children to use the gun improperly and shoot themselves in the face in the uh, event of a non-emergency that becomes an emergency once they've shot themselves. Matt Highland, a spokesman for the Department of Human Services, said Director Jerry Foxhoven pulled the rules last week after discussing the matter with the governor's staff. The department will take a step back to consider how this should be addressed in rules or legislation, he wrote in an email to the register. So, if you're in Iowa or nearby or in one of the 12 states with absolutely no rules whatsoever about having guns in child care centers, you might want to keep an eye on how they resolve this one. Pretty amazing. All right. Let's see. Other news of the last couple of days. We should probably make mention of this kind of weird bit of news. The uh, uh, Donald Trump has been playing in the uh, pardons and sentence commutation game of late. President Trump on Wednesday commuted the prison sentence of Shalom Rubashkin. And yes, he was born in the Soviet Union, but uh, okay, he's an American citizen. Shalom Rubashkin, whose Iowa meatpacking plant, it's all happening in Iowa these days, was the target of a huge immigration raid in 2008 and whose 27 year prison sentence angered many Orthodox Jews, he himself being an Orthodox Jew. Uh, I don't know why it angered Orthodox Jews exactly, other than he is one. But it uh, sounds like he was caught dead to rights, but I, I don't know whether there's controversy surrounding it. It was a fairly celebrated case, I guess, just not one that uh, I paid a great deal of attention to. So he's commuted his sentence, I guess, after eight years or so, eight years of a 27-year sentence. That's not a whole lot. That's not tough on crime. That's not even tough on immigration. I found that really interesting that Trump decided to intervene on behalf of somebody who was violating immigration laws for profit, but maybe that's what makes it better, right? I, what I don't understand, Trump says, is people who violate immigration laws for nothing. If you do it for profit, at least I understand profit. So, okay, fine. Not really, but that's what he's doing. Mr. Raboshkin made national headlines nine years ago after federal agents arrived by helicopter at the agri-processors plant in Postville, Iowa. Uh, yeah, Orthodox Jews in Postville, Iowa and detained nearly 400 undocumented immigrants, including several children who were working there, which is another problem all by itself. Mr. Raboshkin was the company's chief executive, and the plant had been the largest kosher meat packing operation in the country. I bet you wouldn't have guessed where that was. He was later convicted of bank fraud, by the way, in federal court, just to add to his problems. Of course, Donald Trump says, you know, bank fraud. Well, that's just... 
He just made a great deal with the bank. What's the big deal? He's, he made an agreement with the bank that included them giving him money and him not paying it back on fraudulent basis. Big deal. It's called a great deal. Many Jewish leaders have rallied behind Mr. Rabashkin. Isn't that interesting? Whose treatment, they said, was unfair, perhaps even anti-Semitic, and whose sentence they considered unduly harsh and out of line with what other white-collar criminals received. Hmm, maybe. Uh, I don't know what color your collar is if you're the CEO of a meatpacking plant that uh, employs nearly 400 undocumented immigrants, including children. I don't know how white that collar really is, but okay. Mr. Rabashkin had tried for years to get a reduced sentence, but was repeatedly turned down by the courts. Rabashkin has remained strong throughout his ordeal and convinced he would obten eventually obtain justice. Really? Well, he's obtaining it, all right. We, that's what we put a stop to. Said Guy R. Cook, the lead trial lawyer for Mr. Rabashkin, in an email on Wednesday night. Like, I don't know whether it's out of line, by the way, with the sentences other people get on these issues. But I, if you're going to be tough on immigration, I don't know why he would pick this case. It's very weird. Raboshkin and his family are overjoyed. He is free and will be reunited with them. I bet uh, there'll be some digging done, if not in this article, then in the near future, that will make things a lot clearer. Like, uh, well, I know he gives lots of money to Republicans. There was definitely that. Uh, maybe the Kushners know his family. I got no idea. In a statement announcing the commutation, White House officials said they had received letters from more than 30 members of Congress, hmm, including several members of both parties, supporting an examination of the case. The president's review of Mr. Rabashkin's case and commutation decision were based on expressions of support from members of Congress and a broad cross-section of the legal community, the White House statement said. Senator Orrin Hatch, Republican of Utah, said on Twitter that the commutation was, quote, oh boy, a real Hanukkah miracle, and that he was, quote, proud to be part of a large bipartisan group that had pushed for that outcome. Hmm. Mr. Trump's decision was not a pardon, and Mr. Raboshkin, who has been imprisoned in Otisville, New York, must still pay restitution and complete a term of supervised release. The commutation came years after, after uh, rather, years of lobbying by a number of prominent lawyers and politicians who considered the sentence a miscarriage of justice. I think we already heard this. Why, why the repetition? Well, look who's involved here. Alan Dershowitz, Dershbag, he made it. An emeritus law professor at Harvard and a noted Dershbag author, sorry, uh, said he had been working on the case for about five years and had personally asked Mr. Trump to consider commutation. Ah, and he probably did it at Mar-a-Lago with that. Okay, this becomes clearer. Mr. Dershowitz said he had made a similar request to Barack Obama during his presidency, but that he had declined. Of course, uh, well, not surprising. It was just compassion and justice, Mr. Dershowitz said. This was a bipartisan thing. It was a nonpartisan thing, as a matter of fact. And it was the right thing to do. But the commutation was not universally cheered. Robert Teague, a former federal prosecutor in Iowa, said that Mr. Rubashkin's sentence was what he earned because of his conduct and that it's a sad state when politics are allowed to interfere in the justice system. Really, this is 180 degrees contrary to a tough position on illegal immigration, said Mr. Teague, who said Mr. Rubashkin had probably been Iowa's largest employer of undocumented immigrants. In other words, by the way, a magnet for them. I mean, I hate to, you know, even join in passing the, the camp that wants to crack down on and be tough on immigration of any kind, legal or otherwise. Uh, and by the way, yes, the Trump administration is getting set to crack down on legal immigration as well. They just hate immigrants, period. But really, you can't. I mean, and this seems like something that he might have even mentioned in his campaign rhetoric, too, was uh, saying you got to crack down on the businesses that hire illegal immigrants because that's what's, you know, bringing them in. And, uh, well, first chance he gets, he commutes the sentence of somebody who got a tough sentence for for doing this. And uh, once again, so yeah, I, I, by the way, I imagine they'll be working very hard to deport every single one of these uh, workers if they haven't done it already. And and truth be told, Obama's administration might just as well have been responsible for their deportation already anyway, before Trump even got in office. The high profile immigration raid eventually led to the closure of the meatpacking plant in tiny Postville, <clears throat> 
which had become an unlikely hub of Orthodox Jewish life in the Midwest. Around 300 employees of the plant, many of whom were Guatemalan, uh, hardly any of whom were Orthodox Jewish, I would imagine, served prison sentences for identity theft. How about that? And several managers and supervisors were convicted of felony charges of harboring illegal immigrants which they did. The immigration-related charges against Mr. Raboshkin were dropped after he was convicted of fraud. How about that? He never even got convicted on the immigration stuff. Prosecutors in his case said he had fabricated collateral for many loans, causing the banks to lose more than $26 million. That they finally convicted him for. And uh, interesting. So now they're commuting the sentence on that. Again, Trump doesn't believe in bank fraud, I guess. But uh, the people who immigrated, they're the criminals, not the people who agreed to pay them in violation of every law. Oh, well, we'll be right back. Welcome back now to the Kid Grow in the Morning Show here on that Roots Radio. And just to uh, circle back on that Berea College idea, uh, I was able to use the break to uh, search up the comments, a couple of them that I got on. The first from Arliss Bunny saying, by the way, to uh, both me and to Joan, that day. Berea uh, College specializes in arts and preserving Appalachian traditional arts. It is well known in this region for founding a rich local community of artists. That doesn't sound like an arch conservative uh, college full of ultra weirdos the way Hillsdale does, does it? Uh, following up that comment with this one, I have heard genuinely wonderful things about them from progressive artists who are graduates and acquaintances of mine. Berea uh, seems like seems to have evolved into an important mission, and apparently it does. I'm just surprised that Kentucky's congressional delegation is so interested in helping to preserve it. But you know, good on them. I guess good old fashioned constituent service, every once in a while, rises to the top. Uh, let's see. I also had this uh, this comment from Michelle who. Let's see. Uh, uh, I'm trying to figure out how would you pronounce the Twitter handle? She's using so enviro, I guess. So like sewing, S-E-W, enviro. All one word because that's the way those Twitter handles are. S-E-W-E-N-V-I-R-O. Hi, Michelle. We'll just refer to you that way. Noting for us that uh, Berea College is home to the Bell Hooks Institute. And interesting. Of course, that did not ring a, it didn't ring a bell with me. No pun intended. So I looked it up. And uh, did she uh, send me a link? I think she did. Yeah, here it is. The Bell Hooks Institute. And it was interesting. I, I, it caught my eye that it was not capitalized. Lowercase b, lowercase h, but uppercase i, Institute. Bell Hooks Institute. And I thought, I don't know, offhand typo, just sort of informally communicating via Twitter. No, that's actually how it's written and uh, that's part of the intrigue here. I'll I'll include the tweet and a link to it here, but uh, uh, it, it's a pretty interesting, uh, inst- well, it's an interesting institution. And as I recall from peeking at the um, at the website, I was like puzzled by the the layout and, and design of the website. It didn't really tell me the traditional thing. I want to know what is this thing, and uh, it didn't. It didn't tell me in the traditional format, which I was used to, but I'll include it for you. And it's very, uh, it's, it's an interesting place. And uh, I think I, I looked up a little bit about it. And Bell Hooks is the uh, pen name of the writer who uh, founded the Institute. And uh, the pen name being, uh, I guess she adopted her, her grandmother's name for her own use and and therefore I don't know why why the decision not to capitalize and what the background is on that but just uh, uh, a very interesting uh, profile of a very accomplished woman of color and accomplished in the arts and not at all I guess to wrap things up what I was expecting to find when I was first alerted that like Hillsdale College, this college had been singled out for specialized tax treatment. So I'm um, I'm finding that I'm I'm learning on my way through the show. Thanks to you guys who are sending me hints and links and good information about this stuff and keeping me up to date. Thanks for doing it. Uh and a good reminder 
for all of you, not only that you can send those comments and insights to me, uh, either at kgrox at gmail.com or through the Daily Coast messaging service or via Twitter. And please do use the KITM hashtag for that so it's easier for me to pick up on. Uh, I appreciate it. And of course, as always, door is open if you feel like uh, it would interest you to do things this way, to sit down with your smartphone or other electronic recording device and record yourself uh, making your own comments, reading your own essays, reading an article to us that makes the point, whatever it is that we've been missing on the show that you feel like you want to add, email it to us, attach it to the, that email, and uh, we'll download it and queue it up, and it'll save me a few minutes, really, in preparing uh, any show. It's a great convenience to me, uh, for for one thing. Uh, and of course, I think of great interest to everyone else listening to the show to hear the voices of other people who are listening right along with you. And it's just a fun way to sort of break into the podcasting space, too, without having to commit to all the pain in the neck of actually producing these things day in and day out or once a week, as most people do. I don't know how we jumped into the daily game, but uh, I can't give it up now. It's too much fun. So we are in the uh, approach to wrapping up for the day and for the week. Uh, one of the things we like to do on the show every once in a while is throw you a name that you ought to be watching in terms of uh, when will this person get into serious trouble or be thrown out of the administration. We uh, Did we do it at the beginning of the week? Was it the end of last week? We were starting to just sort of name names of lower level administration officials or White House officials who were uh, of particular interest and who were likely to find themselves in the hot seat and under the spotlight for some kind of impropriety in the near future. Uh, but mostly uh, those names were policy-focused people. Here's an interesting twist, and I, I think he's one of a couple of people. I'll have to clear out the uh, pocket in the next couple of days and find the other like serious ultra right wing alt right lunatic weirdo wing nuts that have been embedded in the administration and are getting called out not for their policy approaches but because they're just crazy and have been embedded in a policy making or otherwise responsible position here's one uh dug up by andrew kaczynski over at cnn senior white house advisor at homeland security Repeatedly promoted fringe conspiracy theories on the radio. We're talking this time about Frank Wuko, W-U-C-O. Uh, here is a screenshot of him appearing on Fox and Friends and being identified as a retired naval intelligence officer. Don't know whether that's true or not, but he's crazy. We can tell you that. A White House senior advisor at the Department of Homeland Security provided several far-right conspiracy theories in past radio appearances a CNN K-File review has found. Frank Wuko, a former naval intelligence officer, allegedly anyway, and conservative talk radio host, has served as the White House advisor to DHS since January, since the beginning really, and leads a team tasked with helping to enforce President Donald Trump's executive orders, which suck. So, and are poorly written and mostly unconstitutional. So, no surprise, there's yet another wingnut involved in that stupid sequence of events. A K-File review of more than 40 hours of Wuko's radio appearances shows he regularly promoted unfounded conspiracy theories that have been spread by members of the far right over the years. Among the conspiracy theories Wuko pushed were claims that former President Barack Obama's memoir was ghostwritten by former anti-Vietnam War radical Bill Ayers. It's an oldie but a goodie. Claims that former CIA Director John Brennan converted to Islam. I don't think I ever heard that one. And claims that Attorney General Eric Holder had been a member of the Black Panthers. <laughs> That's only too easy, I guess. K-File previously reported Wuko for, uh, had pushed false claims <clears throat> during radio appearances that Obama was not born in the U.S. Boring. Made disparaging comments about the LGBT community and lamented what he called the Zimbabwefication of America. Uh-oh. A DHS spokesman said the remarks from Wuko in the first K-File piece were years old comments cherry picked from thousands of hours. So what? You said it, right? That had no bearing on his ability to perform his job for the American people. The conspiracy theories Wuko has promoted emerged during a deeper review by K file after that DHS statement. The White House and DHS did not respond to requests for comments by CNN for this story. 
So uh, among them, of course, false claims about Obama's past. In two radio appearances in 2012, Wuko claimed that former Weather Underground leader Bill Ayers ghost wrote Obama's memoir, Dreams from My Father. Why anybody would believe that? I mean, he's a pretty uh, erudite uh, person all by himself, but whatever. Anyway, this is a claim that the far-right bloggers began spreading around the 2008 election and the one that repeatedly resurfaced during Obama's presidency. In response to the claims, Ayers has joked that he wrote joked that he wrote the book, and if right-wing bloggers could prove it, he could start collecting royalties. Many who pushed the claim took his jokes as admissions, which only further fueled the conspiracy theory. In his 2013 book, Public Enemy, Confessions of an American Dissident, Ayers described the claim as being pushed by a bunch of cranks. In a December 2012 appearance on right-wing radio show, Wuko said, you know, I still find it to this day incredibly disturbing that this is a man whom we still know almost nothing about outside of what has been presented to us in two autobiographies, which are, now you know if you believe one of his closest allies, were not even penned by him, but were, you know, penned by William Ayers. And this is William Ayers' words. Wuko made the same claim in an October 2012 episode of The Frank Wuko Show. Wuko also made several claims in July of 2012 episode of his show that Obama had his birth, baptismal, and academic records sealed, and that he had a foreign student ID and applied for foreign aid while at Columbia University. All of these claims have been repeatedly debunked. Foreign aid at Columbia University? You mean just student aid as a foreign student? No, foreign aid. Give foreign aid to the country where I was born, Columbia, because you do that, right? While he was a senator, before he ran for president, they, in they invested over $1 million in legal fees, Wuko said. There's a mechanism for having records legally sealed, and the person who is in the White House right now has all the following records are sealed. His baptismal records, his birth records, his, actually his student application records to the prep school that he went to in Hawaii, which is one of the most well-heeled prep schools in Honolulu, which is not an inexpensive place to live. His student loan application, sealed. He had a foreign student ID, I believe, while he went to Columbia University. Applied for foreign aid. Why would you have a foreign student ID? Is that a separate thing? I don't even think it is. In August of 2012, Wuko promoted the book Dreams from My Real Father, a far-right book and movie that alleged Obama's real father was a family friend named Frank Marshall Davis. Wuko said he received an advanced copy of the film and the movie was presented very well. Wuko also pushed unsupported claims Obama's parents were communists, calling Obama a red diaper baby on one show in 2012. Disparaging name, of course, for the children of communist party members. There's also the fact that he falsely claimed Huma Abedin's parents were part of the Muslim Brotherhood. I don't think we need to go into all the details of these things. We'll read the the uh, bolded headlines that give you the gist of what he was saying back in the day. He also further made unfounded claims that Eric Holder was a member of the Black Panther movement, promoted the claim that John Brennan had converted to Islam. That's a new one on me. Uh, that would be in February of 2013. Wuko promoted a claim that John Brennan, then the nominee to be the director of the CIA, had converted to Islam when he was stationed in Saudi Arabia. Wuko interviewed former FBI agent, this is interesting, John Guan, Guandolo, or Guandolo, I don't know how he pronounces that and who cares. He's the only source for the unsubstantiated claim. There is no evidence to support this claim. I only bring that up because now I'd like to know, where did John work? Was he based in the New York field office by any chance? And how come FBI agents are trustworthy when they're telling you stuff like that, but untrustworthy when they're investigating Donald Trump? But I don't want to make the guy's head explode. Yes, I do. And then, of course, uh, he also was behind one of the claims that Hillary Clinton had faked her concussion. You remember this December 2012 episode of his radio show? He argued that then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was lying about a head injury she sustained the same month she was scheduled to appear at a hearing about the attack on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi, Libya. He called the concussion fake and contended that as a result, Clinton would suddenly fail to remember anything about Benghazi. Wuko demanded that Clinton show evidence of her fall in the form of a bump or a black and blue mark. And then he said that even if she did so, he would not believe her. So I guess really not worth paying attention to in that sense, but uh, perhaps worth 
having that guy's name in mind and tracking whether or not he is ever booted from the administration or called to account in any way. Uh, and I, I tend to doubt it. Let's uh, close out this way. Let's see. Uh, hmm. There's a couple. Of, oh, you know, man, close call on. Two, well, maybe we can fit more than one in there. Uh, it's Friday. Let's go with this one. A groundbreaking case may force controversial data firm Cambridge Analytica to reveal Trump secrets. How about that? What case are we talking about? It's a Mother Jones article. Jackie Flynn Mogensen put this one together. This U.S. professor is counting on British data privacy laws to get some answers. I had this one recommended to me by a couple of people who thought it was a very clever entree into the subject. And uh, let's take a look. Before the 2016 presidential campaign, David Carroll, a media professor at New York's Parsons School of Design, didn't know much, if anything, about Cambridge Analytica. And uh, really, whenever we mention Cambridge Analytica, I feel like we... Did. Is that the sound effect that we want? Or, oh, you know what? Maybe they're more evil than dramatic, and so we'll use the horror version of that, right? In the, in the minor keys, I guess... Uh, Yeah, that's more Cambridge Analytica. That that thunder and lightning kind of helps. Uh, all right. Despite studying data collection and privacy, David Carroll, remember, media professor at New York's Parsons School of Design, says he had probably only heard the name of the data analytics company mentioned once or twice, but that was before the election. And it was before, of course, it became clear that the firm, partially owned by Trump megadonor Robert Mercer and the place where former White House chief strategist Steve Bannon once served as vice president, would help propel Donald Trump into the White House by cultivating vast troves of information on an untold number of American voters to craft controversial and highly targeted political messages. But even still, it wasn't until a few months after the election that alarm bells started going off for Carroll. Paul Olivier Dehay, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that anything close to right, D-E-H-A-Y-E, the co-founder of Personal Data dot i o that's that's what it says and the i o is capitalized is it i o 10 i don't know personal data i o a startup that helps individuals request their data from companies like tinder uber and facebook carol says who even knew that that was a thing told him he suspected that cambridge analytica with offices around the world may have processed the data of american voters in 2016 in the uk while the company's tactics were a complete mystery, if that were true, Carol, an American, could request what information it had on him as allowed by British data protection laws. So, in early 2017, the two set out to pull back the curtain on the data tactics of Cambridge Analytica. Hmm. He was curious. Carol, a self-described data nerd, that's the second description in that way, I think, today. I think Neil Cavuto was the other one, was it? Or, hmm. No, it might have been somebody else. One of the earlier stories. Anyway, Carol, a self-described data nerd, tells Mother Jones, I was curious. He, it was a purely academic curiosity. Just a few months later, Carol would find himself in the midst of a landmark data privacy legal battle. Carol's quest started in February when he formally requested his personal data from Cambridge Analytica, not knowing what, if anything, the company would give him. At that point, the practices of Cambridge Analytica and its connection to both Mercer and Bannon were only starting to come under the microscope. Questions that have since expanded to include the company's possible connection to Russia's social media meddling in the election and, more recently, its potential collaboration with WikiLeaks. As the Daily Beast reported in late October, last year's Cambridge Analytica CEO, uh, last year, he, Alexander Nix, offered WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange assistance in the release of 33,000 of former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's stolen emails. Recently, Nick said, we did not work with Russia in this election, and moreover, we would never work with a third-party state actor in another country's campaign. Just a month after filing the initial request, Carroll, to his surprise, received a letter signed by a chairman of London-based behavioral research and strategic communication firm SCL, the parent company of Cambridge Analytica, with a file 
of his personal data, including a set of political predictions about Carroll made by the firm. It rated Carroll a, quote, very unlikely Republican. This is true. Carroll voted for Democrats in the 2016 general and primary elections and assigned him scores on various political issues. He scored a 3 out of 10 on gun importance, a 7 out of 10 on national security importance, and a 9 out of 10 on traditional social and moral values. He tweeted, I'd rank this somewhat differently, but feels roughly accurate. Could be worse, he said. And some of his tweets are embedded here. Uh, The results were unsettling for Carol and also for his thousands of Twitter followers who he had been updating on his data request efforts. It turned out a wide expanse of personal information about Carol's behavior was being connected to his voter file and shared with commercial entities, research partners, political campaigns, all enclosed in quotes, by the way, and other groups, according to the letter he received. People were kind of terrified that this information was accurate, Carol says. People had a visceral reaction that their voter files aren't being protected like they ought to be. While some of his followers said what he got was typical data for the industry or no big surprise, others called it scary and deeply disturbing. That was probably uh, Susan Collins said that one. But What was particularly problematic for Carroll was that he believes the profile the company sent him wasn't nearly comprehensive. Nix and other Cambridge Analytica executives had boasted that the company has up to a startling 5,000 data points on each of the 230 million voters in the U.S. What Carroll received in March, according to his tweets at the time, was about 200 data points, and even then, it wasn't clear how or where the company got the data or who it was shared with beyond the vague descriptions in the letter. What's more, the response came from someone at a British company, SCL, which suggested to Carol that this data, and presumably the rest of Americans' data, was in fact processed in the UK, just as DeHai thought. And if the data had been processed in the US, Carol suggests, there would be little incentive for them to share it, given the restrictive data laws in America. But according to the 1998 British Data Protection Act, Any company that receives a personal data request is required to provide a description of the personal data, state their purpose of processing it, and disclose any people and countries outside Europe the data were shared with. And it's got a little asterisk there. We'll see what that leads to, perhaps down at the bottom of the article. Carroll argues that Cambridge Analytica failed to share the necessary information when he asked. To get the rest of the data, if there was in fact more, as Nix had bragged, Carroll would have to sue. In April, Carroll and a group of an unspecified number of Americans who have remained anonymous to protect their privacy hired a British solicitor recommended by DeHay, Ravi Naik, uh, N-A-I-K, to launch the first of its uh, first of its kind legal battle against the company. I wish I had known about this. I would have joined it. This case, the group hopes, will clarify the legal requirements for British data collecting companies, including those with information on non-European citizens. More specifically, The Data Protection Act also states that companies, in most cases, this also uh, asterisked, although the asterisks actually are linked to uh, outside uh, sources. So uh, I guess are they other, it looks like they're other Mother Jones articles. So uh, there won't be something down at the bottom likely about that. You'll have to follow it in the link for yourself. So where were we? More specifically, the Data Protection Act also states that companies, in most cases, must obtain explicit consent from individuals before processing sensitive personal data, including political opinions. Cambridge Analytica, Naik argues, or Naik, I don't know how he pronounces his last name, failed to obtain consent from American voters in 2016. He certainly did. I I doubt they asked anybody. What the European regulations on data protection make clear is that if you want to collect and process sensitive personal data here, you should get consent to do so, Naik tells Mother Jones. Political opinions are recognized as a class of sensitive personal data, as information deserving of higher protection. American laws, much less forgiving. If a British company has information about you, you have the right to access it. I don't know if forgiving is the right word. I mean, it makes it sound like we have tough laws about it, and we don't. And we should say American laws offer much less protection for individuals and consumers. If a British company has information about you, you have the right to access it. And if you ask for it, they have to give it to you. Carol tells Mother Jones, 
We don't have that right in the United States. In the U.S., companies don't need consent to collect its citizens' data, and they aren't legally obligated to share it with them. In fact, Carol wouldn't even have a case if the company processed its data in the United States, and it won't if that turns out to be true, uh, or if they just claim it and uh, we uh, are forced to believe it for whatever reason. As Naik told The Guardian earlier this year, this uh, it's this fascinating situation because when it became apparent that Cambridge Analytica had processed Americans' data in Britain, it suddenly opened up this window of opportunity. In the U.S., Americans have almost no rights over their data whatsoever, but the data protection framework is set up in such a way that it doesn't matter where people are. It matters where the data is processed. The result of this case could blow the lid off how private data was used to shape votes and the outcomes of the 2016 election and how it might be used in the future. As University of Maryland law professor and big data expert Frank Pasquale told The Guardian, I I don't know whether he says Pasquale or Pasquale. Sorry, Frank. That's not the important thing. What's important is that he told The Guardian, I think this case will be the model for other citizens' actions against other big corporations. I think we will look back and see it as a really significant case in terms of the future of algorithmic accountability and data protection. It'll probably cause uh, data processing firms to flee Britain or Europe more than anything else. But in the meantime, I'd love to exploit this loophole. Cambridge Analytica opened its doors in 2013 and claims to use big data to predict human behavior and influence political elections, according to the company's website. But what sets Cambridge Analytica apart from other data firms is that it claims to use what's known as psychographics, we've heard this before, to build its voter profiles. Many political campaigns have used demographics, for example, age, race, and gender, to target political messaging. And President Obama successfully and famously used consumer data to target voters. But psychographics, in theories, goes deeper, claiming to be able to predict a voter's personality traits, such as how organized, extroverted, or quick to worry they are, by looking at a person's online and consumer behavior. Cambridge Analytica is the only data firm, Republican or Democratic, that has publicly claimed to use psychographics in political campaigns. All this begs the question, how does Cambridge Analytica then connect up to 5,000 data points of consumer behavior with American voter files to build their profiles? People don't realize that all of their consumer behavior, every time they swipe their credit card, what websites they visit, the TV shows they watch, is being reconnected to your voter file and processed internationally. Carol says, and we can't opt out of it. Nix, however, offered a glimpse into the company's mysterious practices in a presentation he gave nearly two months before Election Day 2016. In it, he claims that his company had been a powerful shaper of public opinion during the 2016 Republican primary campaign, bragging that Cambridge Analytica helped Ted Cruz rise from being one of the less popular candidates to his being the second most threatening contender. He's just the last to drop out, that's all. Cruz, Nick said, accomplished this in part by sending highly targeted, personalized political messages over social media and television to voters in key states. The same controversial tactics that, after Cruz dropped out of the race, were supposedly deployed on behalf of the election's winner. Nix then gives an example of those tactics. Uh, What's particularly frightening about Cambridge Analytica and SEL, Molly McHugh, an information warfare expert and specialist on Russia-U.S. relations, notes, is that they are operating internationally to supposedly influence elections outside of where they're operating in the U.S. and elsewhere. Nobody wants to believe that information coming from some place they don't really understand could change how they think or what their decisions are. But it can for any of us, McHugh tells Mother Jones. Why does some company incorporated in the United Kingdom have our data? What the hell is that for? If it were just about selling shoes or getting you to buy vitamins or whatever crap, I like this quote. Okay, fine. But that's not what it's being used for. And they specifically say that SEL is a company that's marketing themselves as a military grade psychological warfare and psychological operations company. That is a problem for all of us. And that is all we're going to be able to fit into today's show. Of course, I'll give you a link so you can follow up and read the rest of the article. The important part of this, though, I think the explanation of why it might be possible to pry some of this information out of the hands of Cambridge Analytica. The mistake, the happy uh, happenstance, I guess, of it being located in Britain. And I wonder how I wonder if that's why they were such big campaigners for Brexit. Are they European rules in addition 
to British rules? Uh, can they Brexit their way out of it? I don't know. We'll see. Uh, very interesting development. All right. We'll see whether we can get to more about it or whether anything happens over the weekend on it. In the meantime, I hand you over now to the capable hands of Justice Putnam, who will be bringing you the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Here's what we got for Blue Moon Spirits Friday. A clip of former GOP representative and now new Netherlands ambassador Pete Hoekstra arguing with a Dutch journalist that any reports he said Europe has no go zones are fake news. The tapes, though, say otherwise. From Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the K Group in the Morning Show with David Waldman. More to come. Trump denies climate change until it threatens one of his properties. White House aides insist Trump's hires were perfect. Even the Nazi sympathizer, the racist, and the felon who lied to the FBI. And, and Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy gives liberals a huge ray of hope for Christmas. Stay tuned for more.